if I end up doing this during the message, you'll know why. <coughs> Let's turn to Judges chapter 3, please. If you remember, we've been going through the book of Judges on a Wednesday night. And tonight, I'm pretty sure, will be our shortest reading. We're going to read the whole story of this judge. Judges chapter 3. And we'll read verse 31. Oops. Judges chapter 3 and verse 31, it says, And after him, that is, after Ehud, was Shamgar the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. The end. <laughs> Let's pray and commit our time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you that we can come and we can look into your word. Uh, Father, oftentimes, especially in the Old Testament, there is a lot captured in a statement, and that is the case tonight. We pray that you would help us to understand. Uh, Lord, help us to, to see the truth, and may we be able to take it and apply it for ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we get to Shemgar, we're not far through the list of the book of Judges. We had a look at Othniel at the start, we had a look at Ehud, and then we're looking at Shamgar in Judges, the end of Judges chapter 3. But as you can see, just in this short sample size from Othniel and then Ehud, and if you were to go on through Gideon and other ones too, you would see the same thing, there is a break in the normal formula of the book of Judges. Normally there is a statement of Israel's spiritual decline, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Normally there is a record of an oppression and such a nation oppressed Israel for so many years. And oftentimes there is a statement of a time frame after which the judge's influence continued to be a blessing to the nation of Israel and there was rest in the land 40 years or and the people rested 80 years or whatever it might be. None of those things are the case with Shamgar and so we can rightly say that there is a break in the normal formula of the book of Judges. Something like that leaves us very susceptible to theories and information from outside the Bible, and we could call that extra-biblical sources. Some people have looked at the story of Shemgar and thought, because it is such a break with the norm and it seems to just be stuck right in there in between two longer stories, that perhaps that's actually what happened. Someone at a later time after the book of Judges was written just took a story and inserted it into the biblical text. They would suggest that breaking the normal formula suggests that there's a different author or that it was written at a different time period than the rest of the book of Judges. Perhaps they suggest it was inserted to round out the number of judges uh, of, whom they, of whom it is said that they were deliverers. That would make the number seven if you were to include Shemgar. Perhaps it was to include another story to bring it to a round number of 12. As you'll see, that's an important number with the nation of Israel. The problem with this theory is that late additions that seek to make themselves fit into the context don't try and differ from the style into which they're fitting. If someone is trying to insert something at a later time into an earlier text, they seek to match the style, not break with the style. And so although people might look at it and say the style is different, it's illogical to say that someone intentionally made it look different to try and fit in. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. And this objection is something that's not just the case for the book of Judges, but it's aimed at a lot of inconsistencies that people find or appear to find in the scriptures. People look at some things in the Gospels, or they might look at some things in the book of Genesis, and they say, because this breaks with the normal system of the way things are going through, it must have been inserted at a later time. Or maybe this author didn't really know what happened and so they made it up. But as is the case, if you're trying to make something up, 
you don't break with what's already there. You try and fit in with it. Counterfeiters aim to blend in and not stand out. So, it is a different format. What, however, does it still tell us? Let's have a look. First of all, we know his name. After him, after Ehud, was Shamgar. And the name Shamgar, I have absolutely no experience in Hebrew language, nor in any of the Semitic languages, but Shamgar is apparently a Hurrian name, which is the people who are just before the Hittites. Apparently, it comes from that language, and it has caused many people to conclude that Shamgar wasn't an Israelite at all. You know what I'm telling you about, this is a very short verse and people have a lot to say, therefore, because there's not much said in the Bible. Um, this is another thing. They say, well, it looks like a Hurrian name, so he's probably not an Israelite at all. He's probably somebody else who's living in the area. But we've already seen in the book of the Judges, if there's one thing that Israel is known for in the book of Judges, it's that they're mixing with the people of the nations around them. They've got a lot of cultural influences from the nations around them, and even there's intermarrying with the nations around them. And so to see an Israelite with a name that comes from one of the surrounding nations shouldn't automatically make us assume that he's uh, immigrated into the land of Israel and now he's living there. Probably is just an indication of the international influences on Israel at the time. And so it's entirely possible, and I would say probable, that Shamgar was an Israelite. He's described in this verse as the son of Anath. The son of Anath, and look, you can make a list of all the suggestions of what this means. Perhaps this means that he was from Beth Anath, which was a city in Galilee, and that makes very good sense because of the area where Deborah and Barak in Judges chapter 5 were located, and Deborah, as we'll see in just a moment, knew about Shamgar. Judges chapter 1 and verse 33, if you flip back there, you'll see this little town is mentioned. Judges 1 33, it says, Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, nevertheless the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, and Beth Anath became tributaries unto them. And so perhaps he was from this town now, Beth Anath means the house of Anath, and so it could be a reference to the people who live there. Some wonder if Beth Anoth, which is a very close little name change in Judah down the south is more fitting, and the reason why they suggest that is because that's where the Philistines were located, down in the southwest corner of Israel. Others have suggested that the son of Anath is not in fact a reference to his hometown, but rather to his membership among a group of mercenary fighters in the region. That's novel, isn't it? <laughs> the name, I'll just explain that one to you because this you'll find in a lot of um, biblical archaeology articles. The name Anath aside from referring to a place, also refers to a Canaanite, a female Canaanite god of war. And if you excavate, which I'm sure none of us have, <laughs> but if you excavate in the Middle East, especially in the area of northern Israel, you would find arrowheads upon which is written the son of a certain god as a warrior. So it might have um, Joshua, the son of... Baal, whatever it might be, whoever God they were trusting in at the time. And a number of arrowheads have been found, the son of Anath, in that area. And so it is consistent that this name was used as a warrior. Now I would suggest to you that the simplest explanation is probably that Anath was just his mother's name. Anath is a feminine construction in the Hebrew, and so it's probably simply just an explanation of where he came from, his family. Uh, perhaps it could also be a reference to that northern city in Galilee, but we don't need to go to extreme lengths. The reason why I'm not particularly keen on subscribing to the idea of him being a mercenary fighter with a lot of those other people who called themselves the sons of a certain god of the area 
is based upon Shamgar's weapon of choice in Judges chapter 3 and verse 31. We read, And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. An ox goad is a long staff, around about 8 to 10 feet long. It's got a sharp point, often a metal point at one end. It's quite sharp and it's used to prod animals to get them to continue to walk or to guide them one way or the other. And at the other end of the implement, right down the other end of the staff, there is a flattened out section of metal which is used to clean out the dirt from the plough. And so you've got quite a long beam or staff, if you will, that's probably a more accurate description of the object, and you've got a sharp point at one end and a plough cleaner at the other end. But if you imagine a long staff, eight foot long, uh, you've got a sharp, sharpened metal point at one end and a flat, probably sharpenable blade at the other end, doesn't make a bad weapon if you were to choose something. So if you had to go to the shed out the back and choose from the farming implements to go to war, an ox goad probably wouldn't be a bad choice. And so as far as farming implements go, it's not a bad weapon, but I would suggest to you that it's not the weapon of choice of a mercenary soldier. (laughs) You've got arrowheads that say the son of Anath, but he didn't defeat the Philistines with a bow and arrow. (laughs) He fought with an ox goad tells us something a little bit different about this Shamgar. Now, it is interesting that Shamgar used an ox goad against the Philistines because at the close of the Judges period, which is where we come across uh, Samuel and Saul and then David a little bit later, we read about Philistine oppression tactics. Let's have a look over at 1 Samuel chapter 13. Remember that as the judges period draws to an end, you've got Samuel and then immediately you've got Saul. So we're not too far removed from the time of the judges. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and let's read from verse 19. It says, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads, ox goads being included. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan his son, was there found. So Shemgar's use of the ox goad suggests the Philistines may have been using similar tactics back in the time of Shemgar. If you think, well, maybe it's too long for us to assume that, well, Deborah's song in Judges chapter 5 confirms exactly this. Let's have a look at Judges chapter 5 and we'll see verses 6 to 8 probably wasn't just the Philistines who were doing this to the Israelites, it was probably other oppressing nations as well. Judges chapter 5 and verse 6 says, In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, and the travellers walked through byways. The inhabitants of the villages ceased, they ceased in Israel, until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods, then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? Now, just from this small portion of Deborah's song, we'll have a look at this in a few messages' time, we learn that Shamgar's and Jael's days were the same days. In verse 6, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, and then she goes on to describe what they were like. We learn that the highways in this time were too dangerous for travellers to travel on. They couldn't go on the highways. They had to take the back roads, if you will, or the byways because there were too many robbers and thieves attacking people on the highways. 
We see that people wouldn't live in villages. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel, and it's probably a reference to people not living in country or rural areas, but they were gathered together probably in defensed cities or at least in bigger crowds where they could defend themselves. And then we see in verse 8, was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? There was hardly a shield or a spear per 40,000 people in Israel. Now, this was probably not just the result of the Philistines, but it was probably also the Canaanites, because as we'll see when we get to Deborah and Barak, it was the Canaanites that they were primarily fighting against. And so these nations oppressing Israel were probably, in concert, restricting Israel's use of weapons. And so as we put a few of these things together, we would come to the conclusion that Shemgar was probably defending the north of Israel against an ongoing Philistine invasion. They were probably trying to push up from the south towards the north to expand their territory. You know that they were trying to do that quite often. And that as they tried to do this, Shemgar killed 600 Philistines with a rather useful, but nevertheless, a farming implement. The question that we should ask is, was this in one battle? Or was this his kill count over the whole time of his warfare? And I really can't answer that question for you. The only thing that I would suggest to you is that it's not likely, but with God, it's not impossible. It is entirely possible. <laughs> we saw that Samson did similar things. At the end of that verse, we read in Judges chapter 3 and verse 31, and he also delivered... Israel. Now, where it says he also, it's not really speaking about also in relation to killing the 600 Philistines, but rather also in addition to Ehud, also in addition to Othniel, also he delivered Israel. And he doesn't seem to have judged Israel for very long, if at all. Uh, Judges chapter 4 and verse 1, the very next verse, it says, And the children of Israel did, sorry, again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. Now, that's interesting because usually they talk about the preceding judge. Children of Israel did evil after the preceding judge was dead, but this time it skips back before Shamgar and it talks about Ehud who was previous. Shemgar was between Ehud and Deborah. Perhaps he was in a different area to them. But we know that Deborah was aware of him in his song, so he was probably somewhere up in the north. So what should we remember about Shemgar, or what is noticeable, notable about Shemgar? I suppose we could say that he used what he had to do what he could. For the Lord. God was able to do quite a lot with one willing man. Uh, we could see that this was a time of need. Uh, the nation of the Philistines was pushing into the area that God had given to Israel. This is not a, an opportunity for Shamgar to fight against the establishment. This was an invading army that was coming into his country. And he defended his people. He was able to get uh, some deliverance for his people. And he just used what he had. It's a good lesson for all of us to learn if we just take that one simple thought from Shamgar's life. What we have to offer the Lord in terms of talents uh, or resources, uh, time, uh, perhaps even our age. It might feel like just an ox goad in relation to what other people might be able to offer the Lord. But when it comes to our ministry for the Lord, an ox goad can bring deliverance. The Lord can use whatever we commit to him through our service. Shemgar would have had to have been brave to have stood up to other people in a time when an army from his own nation couldn't even equip themselves with armour and weapons. But through Shamgar's bravery, he was able to do something just with what he had. And there's a great encouragement for each of us. We need to think about the things that the Lord has given to us, the opportunities the Lord has given to us, 
and we need to just do our best with them, trusting the Lord can do great things. And so, Shemgar. <laughs> what the Bible tells us about Shemgar is certainly enough if we put it all together, and it's understandable why this man would be included in the story of Judges. Let's pray and we'll commit our time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the story of Shamgar. We thank you, Lord, that we can be uh, encouraged to do what we can with what we have. And we thank you for the opportunity to be able to learn about this man who lived so many thousands of years ago through the inspired word of God. Father, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for the accuracy of the word. Uh, we pray that you would help us not to fall for the lies of those who would tell us that we need to correct the scriptures or that we should disbelieve the things that are written here historically. We thank you, Father, for your word, uh, that we can rely upon it and that the truth of it can guide us. We pray, Lord, now that you would bless our time as we go. We ask, Lord, for safety as we travel. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.